Welcome to the Trinity's Podcast, where we explore theories about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you love God enough to think about Him? Episode 167, Lamson's History of the Unitarian Congregationalists. In the United States nowadays, if you say the word Unitarian, people think of Unitarian Universalism. Unitarian Universalism can be described as a recent or a new religious movement. It's kind of a progressive movement that leaves aside traditional religion. It's not a Christian denomination. However, in some sense, it did grow out of earlier American Unitarian Christianity. There are two ways you can look at it. One way is that early American Unitarian Christianity evolved into this other religion, now called Unitarian Universalism. But I look at it from a Christian perspective. It seems to me that Unitarian American Christianity was Christian. It was a kind of Christian movement. I don't see it as being continuous with Unitarian Universalism. I don't think it's the same type of movement at all. What I think happened is that this type of American Unitarian Christianity went extinct and that out of its corpse grew something else. From a Christian perspective, the gospel ceased being preached. People in this movement ceased even trying to become disciples of Jesus. It just wasn't a Christian movement anymore. In this episode of the Trinity's podcast, we're going to hear a different historical perspective by a very learned and interesting person. This is who we heard from in the last two episodes, Dr. Alvin Lamson, a longtime Congregationalist minister, and for a few years an instructor of theology at Harvard. Lamson was asked to contribute a chapter to a book entitled History of All the Religious Denominations in the United States, containing authentic accounts of the rise and progress, faith and practice, localities and statistics of the different persuasions written expressly for the work by 53 eminent authors belonging to the respective denominations. Third and improved edition, 1852. Dr. Lamson was considered a good representative and kind of spokesperson for Congregationalist Unitarianism. And this is what you're going to hear about from him today. He talks about their beliefs. He talks briefly about the history of Unitarian Christianity, and he gives some statistics about this type of Christianity in America in his day. Lamson seems cheerful about the prospects and the future of American Unitarian Christianity. I think the man was in denial. I think there were multiple factors within the movement and outside the movement that were going to relatively soon kill it off, or if you prefer, transform it into a non-Christian movement. If you're a biblical Unitarian, you are going to hear a lot of things to agree with here, and probably some interesting things that you disagree with here. If you're not a Unitarian Christian, and you take the view that Unitarian Christian is a contradiction in terms, an oxymoron, well, see what you think of Lamson. See if he sounds like a Christian to you. And you might want to raise the question whether or not the end of this movement was inevitable, or if anything could have been done to keep it going. Looking back from a later historical perspective, I think humans are inclined to make a kind of fatalistic fallacy. Y followed X, therefore, given X, Y was inevitable. I think that is a fallacy. Sometimes events occur which could have been prevented at some earlier points. Another thing we have to be careful about is the providential fallacy. X happened, therefore, it was always part of God's plan that X should happen. Don't we want to say that sometimes God merely allows certain things to happen? Don't we want to say that God leaves it to some extent up to us how things go? In any case, if you have any interest in the history of American Christianity, I think you'll enjoy hearing from Dr. Lamson today. Next week, I'll be back with my own thoughts as to why Unitarian Congregationalism didn't last. From here on out, then, the unedited words of Dr. Alvin Lamson. The brevity we must study in this article will not allow us to give anything more than a very meager sketch of the views held by Unitarian Congregationalists of the United States, and add a few facts concerning the history and reception of these views and the general statistics of the denomination. 
Unitarianism takes its name from its distinguishing tenet, the strict personal unity of God, which Unitarians hold in opposition to the doctrine which teaches that God exists in three persons. Unitarians maintain that God is one mind, one person, one undivided being, that the Father alone is entitled to be called God in the highest sense, that He alone possesses the attributes of infinite, underived divinity, and is the only proper object of supreme worship and love. They believe that Jesus Christ is a distinct being from Him and possesses only derived attributes, that He is not the supreme God Himself, but His Son, and the mediator through whom he has chosen to impart the richest blessings of his love to his sinning world. This must be called the great leading doctrine, the distinguishing and, properly speaking, the only distinguishing feature of Unitarianism. Unitarians hold the supremacy of the Father and the inferior and derived nature of the Son. This is their sole discriminating article of faith. On several other points they differ among themselves, professing little reverence for human creeds, having no common standard but the Bible, and allowing, in the fullest sense, freedom of thought and the liberty of every Christian to interpret the records of divine revelation for himself, they look for diversity of opinion as the necessary result. They see not, they say, how this is to be avoided without a violation of the grand Protestant principle of individual faith and liberty. They claim to be thorough and consistent Protestants. There are certain general views, however, in which they are mostly agreed, as flowing from the great discriminating article of faith above mentioned, or intimately connected with it, or which they feel compelled to adopt on a diligent examination of the sacred volume. Of the more important of these views, as they are commonly received by Unitarian Congregationalists of the United States, some account may here be expected. To do full justice to the subject, however, would require far more space than it would be proper for this article to occupy. We begin with the character of God. Unitarians, as we said, hold to his strict personal unity. They are accustomed, too, to dwell with peculiar emphasis on his moral perfections, and especially his paternal love and mercy. They believe that he yearns with a father's tenderness and pity towards the whole offspring of Adam. They believe that he earnestly desires their repentance and holiness, that his infinite overflowing love led him, miraculously, to raise up and send Jesus to be their spiritual deliverer, to purify their souls from sin, to restore them to communion with himself, and fit them for pardon and everlasting life in his presence. In a word, to reconcile man to God and earth to heaven. They believe that the gospel of Jesus originated in the exhaustless and unbought love of the Father, that it is intended to operate on man and not on God, that the only obstacle which exists or which ever has existed on the part of God to the forgiveness of the sinner is found in the heart of the sinner himself, that the life, teachings, and resurrection of Jesus become an instrument of pardon as they are the appointed means of turning man from sin to holiness, of breathing into his soul new moral and spiritual life and elevating it to a union with the Father. They believe that the cross of Christ was not needed to render God merciful, that Jesus suffered not as a victim of God's wrath or to satisfy his justice. They think that this view obscures the glory of the divine character, is repugnant to God's equity, veils his loveliest attributes, and is injurious to a spirit of filial, trusting piety. Thus, all, in their view, is to be referred primarily to the boundless and unpurchased love of the Father, whose wisdom chose this method of bringing man within reach of his pardoning mercy by redeeming him from the power of sin and establishing in his heart his kingdom of righteousness and peace. We now proceed to speak of Jesus Christ. 
As before said, Unitarians believe him to be a distinct being from God and subordinate to him. The following may serve as a specimen of the process of thought, views, and impressions through which they arrive at this conclusion. We beg leave to state them not for the purpose of argument, for we have no wish here to enter into any defense of Unitarian sentiments, but simply that our views may be understood, and the more especially as we have reason to believe that they are often misapprehended. No more of argument will be introduced, and no more of the history of ancient and foreign Unitarianism than appears necessary to put the reader in complete possession of the sentiments and position of the sect as it exists in this country. Unitarians do not rely exclusively or chiefly on what they conceive to be the intrinsic incredibility of the doctrine to which they stand opposed. They take the Bible in their hands, as they say, and sitting down to read it as plain, unlettered Christians, and with prayer for divine illumination, they find that the general tenor of its language either distinctly asserts or necessarily implies the supremacy of the Father and teaches the inferior and derived nature of the Son. In proof of this, they appeal to such passages as the following. This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. John 17.3 For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, 1 Timothy 2.5. My Father is greater than I, John 14.28. My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me, John 7.16. I speak not of myself, John 14.10. I can of my own self do nothing, John 5.30. The Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works, John 14.10. God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye crucified, both Lord and Christ. Acts 2.36 Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior. Acts 5.31 They appeal to such passages and generally to all those in which Jesus Christ is called not God himself, but the Son of God, in which he is spoken of as sent and the Father as sending, appointing him a kingdom giving him authority, giving him to be head over all things to the church. Such passages, they contend, show derived power and authority. Again, when the Son is represented as praying to the Father, and the Father as hearing and granting his prayer, how, ask they, can the plain, serious reader resist the conviction that he who prays is a different being from him to whom he prays? Does a being pray to himself? Unitarians urge that passages like those above referred to, occurring promiscuously, are fair specimens of the language in which Jesus is spoken of in the New Testament, that such is the common language of the Bible, and that it is wholly irreconcilable with the idea that Jesus was regarded by those with whom he lived and conversed as the infinite and supreme God, or that the Bible was meant to teach any such doctrine. They do not find, they say, that the deportment of the disciples and the multitudes towards Jesus, the questions they asked him, and the character of their intercourse with him, indicated any such belief on their part, or any supposition that he was the infinite Jehovah. We meet, say they, with no marks of that surprise and astonishment which they must have expressed on being first made acquainted with the doctrine, on being told that he who stood before them, who ate and drank with them, who slept and waked, who was capable of fatigue and sensible to pain, was in truth the infinite and immutable one, the preserver and governor of nature. They contend that the passages generally adduced to prove the supreme deity of Jesus Christ fail of their object, that without violence they will receive a different construction, that such construction is often absolutely required by the language itself, or the connection in which it stands, that most of these passages, if carefully examined, far from disproving, clearly show the distinct nature and inferiority of the Son. They notice the fact as a remarkable one, that of all the proof texts, as they are called, of the Trinity, there is not one on which, at one time or another, eminent Trinitarian critics have not put a Unitarian construction, and thus they agree that Unitarianism may be proved from the concessions of Trinitarians themselves. 
To the doctrine of three persons and one God, Unitarians object again its intrinsic incredibility. They say that they cannot receive the doctrine because in asserting that there are three persons in the divinity, it teaches, according to any conception they can form of the subject, that there are three beings, three minds, three conscious agents, and thus it makes three gods. And to assert that these three are one is a contradiction. So too with regard to the Savior. To affirm that the same being is both finite and infinite, man and God, they say appears to them to be a contradiction and an absurdity. If Jesus Christ possessed two natures, two wills, two minds, a finite and an infinite, they maintain that he must be two persons, two beings. Unitarians of the present day, as far as we know, do not think it lawful directly to address Christ in prayer. They think that his own example, the direction he gave to his disciples, when ye pray, say, Our Father, and such expressions as the following, In that day, that is, when I am withdrawn from you into heaven, ye shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Not only authorize, but absolutely require prayer to be addressed directly to the Father. To prove that the ancient Christians were accustomed thus to address their prayers, they allege the authority of Origen, who lived in the former part of the third century and was eminent for piety and talents and in learning surpassed all the Christians of his day. If we understand what prayer is, says Origen, it will appear that it is never to be offered to any originated being, not to Christ himself, but only to the God and Father of all, to whom our Savior himself prayed and taught us to pray. In regard to the metaphysical nature and rank of the Son, and the time at which his existence commenced, Unitarians undoubtedly differ in opinion. Some hold his pre-existence, and others suppose that his existence commenced at the time of his entrance into the world. The question of his nature they do not consider as important. Some take this view. They think that the testimony of the apostles, the original witnesses to whom we are indebted for our knowledge of him, bears only on his birth, miracles, teachings, life, death, resurrection, and ascension, that is, on his character and offices, and that beyond these we need not go. But these are all which it is important that we should know or believe. But the rest is speculation, hypothesis, with which, as practical Christians, we have no concern. That our comfort, our hope, our security of pardon and eternal life depend not upon our knowledge or belief in it. At the same time, all entertain exalted views of his character and offices. In a reverence for these, they profess to yield to no class of Christians. The divinity which others ascribe to his person, they think may with more propriety be referred to these. We believe firmly, says one of the most eminent writers in the sect, in the divinity of Christ's mission and office, that he spoke with divine authority and was a bright image of the divine perfections. We believe that God dwelt in him, manifested through him, taught men by him, and communicated to him his spirit without measure. We believe that Jesus Christ was the most glorious display, expression, and representative of God to mankind, so that through seeing and knowing him, we see and know the invisible Father. So that when Christ came, God visited the world and dwelt with men more conspicuously than at any former period. In Christ's words, we hear God speaking. In his miracles, we behold God acting. In his character and life, we see an unsullied image of God's purity and love. We believe, then, in the divinity of Christ, as this term is often and properly used. Unitarians do not think that they detract from the true glory of the Son. They regard him as one with God in affection, will, and purpose. This union, they think, is explained by the words of the Savior himself. Be ye also one, says he to his disciples, even as I and my Father are one. One not in nature, but in purpose, affection, and act. Through him, Christians are brought near to the Father, and their hearts are penetrated with divine love. By union with him as the true vine, they are nurtured in the spiritual life. In his teachings they find revelations of holy truth. They ascribe peculiar power and significance to his cross, to that emblem of self-sacrificing love, 
They teem with emotions which language is too poor to express. The cross is connected in the minds of Christians with the atonement. On this subject, Unitarians feel constrained to differ from many of their fellow Christians. Unitarians do not reject the atonement in what they believe to be the scriptural meaning of the term. While they gratefully acknowledge the mediation of Christ and believe that through the channel of his gospel are conveyed to them the most precious blessings of a father's mercy, they object strongly to the views frequently expressed of the connection of the death of Christ with the forgiveness of sin. They do not believe that the sufferings of Christ were penal, designed to satisfy a principle of stern justice. For justice, say they, does not inflict suffering on the innocent in order to pardon the guilty. And besides, they believe that God's justice is in perfect harmony with his mercy, that to separate them, even in thought, is greatly to dishonor him. They believe that, however the cross stands connected with the forgiveness of sin, that connection, as before said, is to be explained by the effects wrought on man and not on God. They believe that in thus teaching they do not rob the cross of its power, nor take away from the sinner ground of hope. To the objection that sin requires an infinite atonement, and that none but an infinite being can make that atonement, they reply by saying that they find in their Bibles not one word of this infinite atonement, and besides that no act of a finite being, a frail, sinning child of dust, can possess a character of infinity or merit an infinite punishment that it is an abuse of language, so to speak, and further, that if an infinite sufferer were necessary to make due atonement for sin, no such atonement could ever be made, for infinite cannot suffer, that God is unchangeable, and it is both absurd and impious to ascribe suffering to him. God cannot die, and admitting Jesus to have been God as well as man, only his human nature suffered, that there was no infinite sufferer in the case that thus the theory of the infinite atonement proves a fallacy, and the whole fabric falls to the ground. Still is not the sinner left without hope, because he leans on the original and unchanging love and compassion of the Father, to whom as the prime fountain we trace back all gospel means and influences, and who is ever ready to pardon those who through Christ and his cross are brought to repentance for sin and holiness of heart and life. Further, the Unitarians reply, whatever mysterious offices the cross of Christ may be supposed to possess beyond its natural power to affect the heart, it must owe that efficacy wholly to the divine appointment. And thus the nature and rank of the instrument becomes of no importance, since the omnipotence of God can endow the weakest instrument with power to produce any effect he designs to accomplish by it. Since the omnipotence of God can endow the weakest instrument with power to produce any effect he designs to accomplish by it. They quote Bishop Watson, a Trinitarian writer, as saying that all depends on the appointment of God, that it will not do for us to question the propriety of any means his goodness has appointed merely because we cannot see how it is fitted to the end that neither the Arian nor the humanitarian hypothesis necessarily precludes atonement by the death of Jesus, charge delivered in 1795. By the Holy Spirit, Unitarians suppose is meant not a person, but an influence, and hence it is spoken of as poured out, given, and we read of the anointing with the Holy Spirit, phrases which they contend preclude the idea of a person. It was given miraculously to the first disciples, and gently as the gathering dews of evening distills upon the heart of the followers of Jesus in all ages, helping their infirmity, ministering to their renewal, and ever strengthening and comforting them. It is given in answer to prayer, as Christ said, If ye, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Luke 11.13 
Unitarians believe that salvation through the gospel is offered to all on such terms as all by God's help, which he will never withhold from any who earnestly strive to know and do his will and lead a pure, humble, and benevolent life, have power to accept. They reject the doctrine of native total depravity, but they assert that man is born weak and in possession of appetites and propensities by the abuse of which all become actual sinners, and they believe in the necessity of what is figuratively expressed by the new birth, that is, the becoming spiritual and holy, being led by that spirit of truth and love which Jesus came to introduce into the souls of his followers. This change is significantly called the coming of the kingdom in the heart, without which, as they teach, the pardon of sin, were it possible, would confer no happiness, and the songs of paradise would fall with harsh dissonance on the ear. Unitarians sometimes speak of reverence for human nature, of reverence for the soul. They reverence it as God's work, formed for undying growth and improvement. They believe that it possesses powers capable of receiving the highest truths. They believe that God, in various ways, makes revelations of truth and duty to the human soul, that in various ways he quickens it, kindles in it holy thoughts and aspirations, and inspires it by his life-giving presence. They believe that however darkened and degraded, it is capable of being regenerated, renewed by the means and influences he provides. They believe that it is not so darkened by the fall, but that some good, some power, some capacity of spiritual life is left in it. But they acknowledge that it has need of help, that it has need to be breathed upon by the divine spirit. They believe that there is nothing in their peculiar mode of viewing Christianity which encourages proscription, encourages pride and self-exaltation. They believe that the heart which knows itself will be ever humble. They believe that they must perpetually look to God for help. They teach the necessity of prayer and a diligent use of the means of devout culture. They do not thus teach reverence for human nature in any such sense, they think, as would countenance the idea that man is sufficient to save himself without God. They pray to him for illumination, pray that he will more and more communicate of himself to their souls. They teach the blighting consequences of sin. They believe that in the universe which God has formed, this is the only essential and lasting evil, and that to rescue the human soul from its power, to win it back to the love of God, of truth and right, and to obedience, to a principle of enlarged benevolence which embraces every fellow being as a brother, is the noblest work which religion can achieve and worth all the blood and tears which were poured out by Jesus in his days of humiliation. While they earnestly inculcate the necessity of a holy heart and a pure and benevolent life, they deny that a man is to be saved by his own merit or works, except as a condition to which the mercy of God has been pleased to annex the gift of everlasting life and felicity. Unitarian Congregationalists believe firmly in a future retribution for sin and holiness. There is nothing peculiar in the sentiments which, as a body, they entertain of the Bible. They regard the sacred books of it as containing the words of a divine revelation miraculously made to the world. They receive it as their standard, their rule of faith and life, interpreting it as they think consistency and the principles of sound and approved criticism demand. They make use of the common, or King James Version, as it is called, but like all well-informed Christians, they think that a reverence for truth and a desire to ascertain the will of God justify and require them, wherever there is any doubt about the meaning, to appeal to the original, or to compare other versions. In doing this, they say that they do not fear that they shall be condemned by any intelligent Christian. In proof of their reverence for the Bible, they appeal to the circumstances that several of the ablest defenders of Christianity against the attacks of infidels have been Unitarians, a fact, say they, which they are confident no one acquainted with the theological literature of modern ages will call into question. To the charge that they unduly exalt human reason, Unitarian Christians reply by saying that the Bible is addressed to us as reasonable beings that reverence for its records and respect for the natures which God has bestowed on us and which Christ came to save make it our duty to use our understanding and the best lights which are afforded us for ascertaining its meaning, that God cannot contradict in one way what he records in another, that his word and works must utter a consistent language, 
that if the Bible be his gift, it cannot be at war with nature and human reason. That if we discard reason in its interpretation, there is no absurdity we may not deduce from it. That we cannot do it greater dishonor than to admit that it will not stand the scrutiny of reason. That if our faculties are not worthy of trust, if they are so distempered by the fall that we can no longer repose any confidence in their veracity, then revelation itself cannot benefit us, for we have no reason left of judging of its evidences or import, and are reduced at once to a state of utter skepticism. Such, omitting minor differences, are the leading views of the Unitarian Congregationalists of the United States. They do not claim to hold all these views as peculiar to themselves. Several of them they share in common with other classes of Christians or with individuals of other denominations. Of the history and statistics of Unitarians in the United States, we have left ourselves little room to speak. The Unitarians of these days do not profess to hold any new doctrines. They speak of its antiquity and revival. The history of ancient Unitarianism I must pass over, both as foreign to the object of this sketch, and a subject which would require more space than is assigned for our whole article. I will only state in a single paragraph what modern Unitarians contend that they are able to prove in regard to the early prevalence of this doctrine. They begin by stating that the Jews before the time of the Savior were strictly Unitarian, that it is a fact as well ascertained as any fact can be that the Jewish Christians of the early ages were so also, being believers in the simple humanity of Jesus, that several of the early fathers recognized this fact and that this belief was not originally deemed heretical. They contend and profess to show that all the fathers for more than 300 years after the commencement of the Christian era never fail of ascribing supremacy to the father, and held the strict and proper inferiority of the son, that they made him a distinct being from the father, though many of them assigned him from all eternity a sort of metaphysical or potential existence in the father as an attribute that is, his wisdom or reason, which attribute took a separate personal existence a little before the creation of the world and became an agent of the Father in its formation. In this they differ from the Arians, who taught that he was created out of nothing. Unitarians affirm that the germ of the doctrine of the Trinity is first traced in the learned Platonizing converts who brought it with them from the school of human philosophy. They say that its origin is thus, in their view, satisfactorily explained. They contend that it was of gradual formation, and that they can trace its growth from age to age, till it acquired something like its present form about the middle of the 5th century. These views, they think, have been well established in modern writings, both in this country and in England. We now come to modern Unitarianism. The history of this, too, in foreign countries, we must dismiss in some half a dozen or a dozen sentences, stating merely a few general facts. We discover traces of anti-Trinitarian sentiments in the early days of the Reformation under Luther, and Unitarianism was openly avowed and defended by Salarius, a learned man, a native of Stuttgart, born in 1499, and for some time united in warm friendship with Luther and Melanchthon. Several of the learned contemporaries of Luther in Germany and Switzerland embraced the same sentiments. Servetus, a native of Aragon, was burned as a heretic for his Unitarianism at Geneva in 1553. About the same time, a society of Unitarians in Italy was broken up and dispersed by the Inquisition. A retreat was afterwards opened to them in Poland. They had a college at Rakow, numbering at one time more than a thousand students. They had churches in all parts of the kingdom, and their sentiments were embraced by many of the chief nobility. There they flourished many years and left behind them many monuments of their learning and zeal. They were banished from the kingdom in 1660. 
Some went to England, some to different parts of Germany, and some to Transylvania, where they still exist as a distinct sect. Holland still contains a considerable number, and most of the pastors of Germany hold Unitarian sentiments. In England, they are traced back to the early part of the 16th century, but there, as elsewhere, they were subject to severe persecution for their opinions, and some of them sealed their faith with their blood. Their doctrine, however, was not suppressed, and English Unitarianism numbers a long line of learned men, the ornaments of their age and of humanity. Among them we find the names of Emlyn, Whiston, Dr. Samuel Clark, Lardner, Price, Priestley, Lindsay, Aiken, Jeb, Rees, and many others besides the three greater lights, Locke, Newton, and the poet Milton. Unitarian sentiments are now extensively diffused among the Presbyterians of England and in the north of Ireland, and Unitarian houses of worship exist in different places in Scotland. The last report of the American Unitarian Association, May 1842, states the number of Unitarian congregations in England at about 300, in Ireland at 39, in Scotland at 12. Of those who have renounced the Church of Rome in Holland, Switzerland, France, and Germany, the same document affirms that not less than one-half hold the Unitarian faith. American Unitarianism dates back at least to the middle of the 18th century. In a letter to Dr. Moore, dated May 15, 1815, the older President Adams says, in reply to a statement that Unitarianism was then only 30 years old in New England, I can testify as a witness to its old age. He goes back 65 years and names some clergymen and, among others, Dr. Mayhew of Boston and Gay of Hingham, who were Unitarians. Among the laity, he adds, how many could I name lawyers, physicians, tradesmen, farmers? There was, however, little open avowal of Unitarianism at this period, nor until after the American Revolution, nor were there many congregations professedly Unitarian until after the commencement of the 19th century. Though as early as 1756, Emlyn's inquiry into the scripture account of Jesus Christ was republished in Boston and extensively read. In 1785, the society worshipping at King's Chapel, Boston, adopted an amended liturgy from which Trinitarian sentiments were excluded. Between that period and the end of the century, Unitarian sentiments manifested themselves to a small extent in Maine, and Mr. Bentley openly preached them in Salem, Massachusetts. The same sentiments were preached in the southern parts of the state, in Plymouth and Barnstable counties, in the latter of which there were many Unitarians. In the western part of Massachusetts, in Connecticut, Rhode Island, and New Hampshire, Unitarianism had made but little progress. Out of New England, few if any traces of it were visible, except at Northumberland and Philadelphia, where Dr. Priestley had made some converts. Thus closed the 18th century. But though, as before remarked, there was at this time but little open profession of Unitarianism, the general tone of thinking and feeling in Boston and the vicinity was decidedly Unitarian, or at least the current was strongly setting that way. During the first 15 years of the present century, controversy on the subject was seldom or never introduced into the pulpit, but Unitarianism was making silent progress. Many, having ceased to hear the opposite sentiments inculcated, embraced it, often without any distinct consciousness of the fact. The term Unitarianism was then seldom heard in New England, those since called Unitarians being then denominated liberal Christians. The appointment of one of them to the Divinity Professorship at Cambridge in 1805 was the occasion of some controversy. The year 1815 formed an epoch in the history of American Unitarianism. The circumstances were briefly these. Mr. Belsham, in his Memoirs of Lindsay, published in London in 1812, had introduced a chapter on American Unitarianism, or, as it was expressed, on the progress and present state of the Unitarian churches in America. This was republished in Boston in 1815 with a preface by the American editor, the object of the republication being to sound the alarm against Unitarianism on this side of the Atlantic. The pamphlet was immediately reviewed in The Panoplist, an orthodox publication of the day. The two publications caused great excitement, 
The Panoplist especially was complained of by Unitarians as greatly misrepresenting their sentiments and containing many injurious aspersions on their character. A controversy ensued, Dr. Channing leading the way, in a letter addressed to the Rev. S. C. Thatcher, in which he charges the Panoplist with the attempt to fasten on the Unitarians of this country all the odium of Mr. Belsham's peculiar views, and replies to what he conceived to be other misrepresentations of the reviewer, particularly to the accusation of hypocritical concealment brought against the Unitarians. Several pamphlets were written in this controversy by Dr. Channing, Dr. Samuel Worcester of Salem, and some others, mostly in 1815. The tendency of this controversy was to draw a sharp and distinct line between the parties. The panoplist had urged on the Orthodox the necessity of a separation in worship and communion from Unitarians. From that time, the exchange of pulpits between the clergymen of Orthodox and liberal denominations in a great measure ceased, though all were not prepared for this decided step. Many congregations were much divided in opinion. A separation was viewed by many as a great evil. Many were strongly opposed to it. The Unitarian controversy, strictly so called, brought up the question of the rights of churches and parishes, respectively, in the settlement of a minister. Before the excitement of this subject had subsided, another controversy arose, occasioned by Dr. Channing's sermon preached at Baltimore at the ordination of Mr. Sparks. This controversy embraced the doctrine of the Trinity and the doctrines of Calvinism generally, all of which were subjected to a very thorough discussion. Professor Stewart of Andover appeared in defense of the Trinity, and Mr. Andrews Norton in opposition to it in an article in the Christian Examiner subsequently enlarged and published in a separate volume under the title A Statement of Reasons for Not Believing the Doctrine of Trinitarians Concerning the Nature of God and the Person of Christ. Dr. Woods of Andover defended the doctrines of Calvinism, and Dr. Ware of Harvard University replied, There were several replications and rejoinders on both sides. A discussion was at the same time going on between Mr. Sparks of Baltimore and Dr. Miller of Princeton. By the time this controversy subsided, the Orthodox and Unitarian Congregationalists were found to constitute two distinct bodies. The ministers of both divisions, however, in Massachusetts, still annually met in convention as Congregationalists, a name which belongs equally to both, but have, elsewhere, little religious fellowship or communion. Such is the origin and history, so far as they can be given here, of the American Unitarians viewed as constituting a distinct class or denomination of Christians. They are mostly the descendants of the old Congregationalists of New England and are still Congregationalists, the forms of which they value for what they regard as their scriptural simplicity as well as for many ancestral associations. It is difficult to estimate the number of Unitarians in the United States, and of their character for intelligence, piety, and benevolence it does not become us in the present article to speak. When they have no separate place of worship, they continue in many instances united in worship with Orthodox societies. From the 15th report of the Executive Committee of the American Unitarian Association, May 1840, it appears that the number of religious societies and churches professedly Unitarian in Massachusetts was then 150, in Maine, 15, in New Hampshire, 19, and out of New England, 36. The number has since increased and is now estimated in all about 300. These are Congregational Unitarians to whom this article refers. The same document assigns to the denomination called Christians, who are also Unitarians, in 1833, 700 ministers, 1,000 churches, from 75,000 to 100,000 communicants, and from 250,000 to 300,000 worshipers. Besides the Congregational Unitarians, it is computed that there are now in the United States about 2,000 congregations of Unitarians, chiefly of the sects called Christians, Universalists, and Friends or Quakers. Among the periodicals which utter Unitarian sentiments at the present time are the Christian Register, a weekly paper commenced in Boston in 1822, the Monthly Miscellany of Religion and Letters, a monthly publication in Boston, commenced in 1829, and The Christian Examiner. 
The latter was originally issued under the name of The Christian Disciple, a monthly publication commenced at Boston in 1813 under the superintendence of the late Dr. Noah Worcester. It continued under his charge until 1819, when a new series was commenced under different editors. This series terminated with the fifth volume at the end of 1823. The work then took the name of The Christian Examiner, which is still continued, a number being issued every two months, the 34th volume being now in the course of publication. This work, which combines literature with theology, has always sustained a high reputation for learning and ability, nearly all the more eminent Unitarians of the day, having been at different times numbered among its contributors. The American Unitarian Association was founded in Boston in 1825. An extensive correspondence is carried on, and other business transacted by the General Secretary of the Association, and there are now several auxiliaries in different parts of the United States. The Association holds its annual meetings at Boston in May of each year, at which the report of the Secretary is read, after which various topics are discussed in speeches or addresses. The Association, through its Executive Committee, issues tracts monthly, of which the 16th volume is now in the course of publication. It furnishes temporary aid to small and destitute societies, and does something for domestic missions, particularly in the western states. There is also a book and pamphlet society, not under the control of the association, but which cooperates in some measure with it, and distributes a large number of books and tracts. The last annual report of the association speaks of the condition and prospects of the denomination as in a high degree encouraging. Societies, it affirms, are multiplying in New England and in various parts of the South and West. If the spirit of active controversy in the sect is passing away, as some think, the importance of a living, practical faith and an earnest piety was never more deeply felt. The present year, active efforts have been made, and not wholly in vain, to raise funds to meet the wants of the denomination, especially to educate young men for the ministry, to assist destitute societies, and support missionaries, in different ways to promote the cause of spiritual Christianity and aid in building up the kingdom of the Redeemer in the world. Today's thinking music has been Star Pause by Sacred Motion. If you love the Trinity's podcast, please share the podcast on social media. Another thing you can do is give us an honest rating and review in the iTunes store for your country. You can support the podcast by giving us a one-time or a monthly donation through PayPal. Just look for the orange buttons on the right side of any blog post. Lastly, make your voice heard. Give us a comment on the blog post for this episode, or join our very active Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash trinities. Don't forget then to share, to rate, to chip in when you can, and to talk back. Thanks for listening. We'll see you online at trinities.org. Till next time, don't forget to love God with all your mind.